My name's Ryan, I get to serve as our youth pastor here. And you may have heard that this week has been a little bit turbulent for the Caminetti family, but we're very thankful that God has been really watching over Pastor Joe and is sending him toward a full recovery. But today, when one of Pastor Joe's closest friends, John Nuzo, found out about everything that Pastor Joe was going through, he reshuffled everything in his schedule to be able to be here this weekend and preach to our church. And that's genuinely out of his love for Pastor Joe and love for Believer's Church. Pastor John pastors in Victory, uh, Victory Family Church in uh, Cranberry Township in PA, and they have campuses in multiple places. And he's an incredible pastor, has an incredible heart. And yes, he has as many good stories of being Italian as Pastor Joe. You're going to love Pastor John. So without any further ado, can we give a Believer's Church welcome at your campus to Pastor John Nuzzo? Thanks, Ryan. Love you, Ann. Hey, it is, it's so wonderful to be with you. I absolutely love your pastor and his family in this church. Uh, all the, the campuses, TCI, uh, Boardman, uh, online. We love you guys so much. Uh, you know, Pastor Joe and I have been friends a really, really long time. Um, I mean, you know, you think about this summer, it'll be 40 years that he's, that, that since the church started, he and Pastor Gina being here for 40 years. Guys, isn't that that's just remarkable? Aren't you grateful for your pastors? <laughs> Pastor Joe's on the board of our church. He's been such a blessing to me. He's uh, Really, he's a pastor's pastor. He's, people look to him around the country. Uh, I've always said, and Michelle and I have said, you know, if I'm picking a pastor in my life, uh, Joe Caminetti's the guy I pick. And uh, you're so fortunate to, to have someone who's just stayed put. And of course, I had the chance to get to talk to him yesterday, and he's doing so well, and I know God's going to bring him to a full recovery. But I just wanted to come to be with you and just to be able to share with you this weekend and when, when we FaceTime sometimes and they're a little uncertain, it's good to have some old folks show up. And uh, no, I just wanted to be with you guys because I love your pastors so much and love this church so much. Now, of course, as you could tell, I'm not Swedish. Yeah, I'm, I'm Italian. So, uh, so Pastor Joe, you know, uh, I'm in Cranberry Township. There's a lot of uh, Medigan in, in, in Cranberry Township. That means they're, they're, they're not ethnic. And so when I get to come to, to Warren, a lot of Italian folks here. And you have really good food here, just so you know. Yes, you do. Yes, so if you come to Cranberry, I apologize in advance. But, uh, but seriously, you know, I, I, I like that fun and just enjoy myself with folks. And, uh, and so I, I, do, I, I sometimes can imitate voices because I hear voices. I don't answer them. That's okay. Listen, but if I hear it, it's like, I, I don't know, it's just something, my wife calls it a, a mental disorder, but it's okay. And uh, there's a crown for her in heaven. But when I think of Pastor Joe, I, I just, I can't help it. I see him. Has anyone ever watched the first two Godfather movies? Anybody here? It's a requirement in our church. And so, uh, now the third one, but the first two, and so I think of him, I think of Don Corleone. Just like he's the godfather, right, of pastors. And, but I would just think, if Don Corleone were here today, what he would say to you all about Pastor Joe, and it would be something like this. Uh, that, uh, uh, Joe Caminetti, he's a, he's a man of God, and I love him, and, uh, and I respect him. And many people do around the country. And some don't. But uh, he prays for them. I don't pray so much. So I, I send a special messenger. Huh? And they visit them. And then they treat him wonderfully. That's what Joe had said. So, yeah, I hear voices. It's, it's all right. But, no, I, I just love your church, and I love your pastor. I want to just share with you just a, a simple message. And this, this sermon, if you will, isn't what changed my life, but the message behind it did. Because Jesus came to change the lives of people, not to start religion, right? right. And so I'm going to talk to you about that. And, but it started for me when I was in college and I was not walking with God. 
I'd come to know the Lord as a teenager and immediately walked away. And one of the reasons is there wasn't a church like this. There wasn't a youth pastor like, the, like Ryan, the young man that just stood here in, my li- in your life and in this church. And so uh, there, there was, I didn't know anything about God other than I'd come to know Christ through my mom's influence in my life. But I immediately walked away from God and, and I find myself in college. And honestly, I'm basically starting a life of addiction, getting high every day of my life while in school, feeling no purpose. And, and, and just, I knew where I was headed, but I couldn't stop it. And so I go home for the summer and my mom being a strong Christian, you know how moms are, they want to try to help you come back to Jesus. So she said, our church is having a Sunday school picnic. Would you like to go? And I thought, yeah, just like I would like to be shot in my head. Yeah, I want to go to, uh, imagine, the Sunday school picnic. Well, that sounds like fun. But my mother's not stupid. She said, now this is an Italian, literally, like an Italian Assemblies of God church. And everybody that went there had a vowel at the end of their name. And she said, did I tell you the food that they bring? And I said, she's telling all of her five sons. And uh, no, she said, this isn't like, you know, no offense if you're a Medigan, if you bring, go to the, you go to, if you have like hot dogs and hamburgers, fruit. <laughs> she said, no, 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 they bring roasters full of, of, of brajol and, and cavatel and, and, and peppers and a sausage. And, and so my brothers and I are like, oh, we'll go there. We're going to go eat and leave, right? So they did some kind of, to me, was a cheesy service. He's on guitar and uh, he sang. So I don't know what he talked about. And so my mother wants me to meet him because she thinks, you know, he'll rescue you. And so I thought, I will cure her from ever doing this to me again. He introduced himself, you know, he was very polite. I said, listen, I used to be a Christian and I, when I, and I told him every vile thing I was doing, and it was vile. And I said, and I'm not going to stop. I'm going to go back to college, and I'm going to start all over again. But it's nice to meet you. So I'm thinking, you know, that I'm going to get the response that I would expect to get, some kind of beat down. But he never changed his expression. Here's what he said to me. He said, John, you just have no concept of how much God loves you, do you? I thought, is he out of his mind? Didn't he? Just, God doesn't love me. Did, I, I just told him everything I did, and I plan to go do it again. I'm thinking, this, what's wrong with you? And I could, he could see the look in my face, and I'm. So finally, I, I just said, "Did you hear me?" He said, "Yeah." He said, um, "Gosh, I, I, you just have no concept of how much God loves you, do you?" Then he shook my hand, and he said, "But it's so nice to meet you." He walked away. I thought. What's wrong with that dude? That was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. And now from that point forward, I can't get away from that one sentence. See, it isn't my effectiveness of speech that leads people to Jesus. It's people showing me who he is. And I went back to school and did exactly what I told him I would do. But every time I did, something inside me, those words... I would use these words today. Back then, I wouldn't use them today. They seemed to haunt me. They just wouldn't go away. In less than a year and a half after meeting that man at a picnic, I'm in a Bible school obeying the call of God in my life. But I want to talk to you about why that happened and how that man, God, used him in a way. And Actually, he's from the Youngstown area. Uh, 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 By the way, last name Enzovino, so he's... Irish guy. And, uh, <laughs> but one interaction with someone who reflected Jesus changed my life. And I want to talk to you about that today. I want to, in fact, just talk to you about a simple message on, on the day that God ran. Because in my mind, when God's running, he's running either away from me or if he is running to me, it's going to be a bad day. People have said years, I mean, through the years, Man, God's trying to get even with me. And I think, listen, if God's getting even with you, there is no tomorrow. If he wants to get even, you don't, that's not like a, like a five-year process. If God decides to harm you, there's, there's no recourse from that. 
but that's how I saw him. And so let me take you to a scripture in Luke 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and notorious and especially wicked sinners were all coming near to Jesus to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes kept muttering and indignantly complaining and said, this man accepts, receives, and welcomes preeminently wicked sinners, and then he has the gall to eat with them. Now, these are not just, these aren't modest sinners. These aren't amateur sinners. These are sinners that have a podcast. And something about Jesus is present that they're drawn to him. Something about Jesus that it's so clear that he cares for them and wants to be near them that the religious crowd who were not right with God but just thought they were better than others, they could notice it. And they said, what, what are you doing? You treat them like they matter to you. And they were, they were disgusted at the way Jesus treated these people. Jesus wasn't only comfortable with, with, with them, but they were drawn to him. What is it about the presence of Jesus that necessarily doesn't show up in a Christian's life today that made them not only want to listen to him, but listen, but be near him? What, they were with the son of the living God, not knowing who he was. And yet the way he treated them, the way he spoke to them, made them want to be, want, want to listen. And they, they desperately wanted to be near him. In Luke 19, we see a, a, the reason Jesus makes it very clear. Verse 10, he said this. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. See, the Pharisees didn't know they themselves were lost. And the Pharisees were the religious crowd that kept all the rules, or at least they thought they did. And they were self-righteous. They were better than than others. That was their righteousness. And they, they always were pointing out the sins of people. But Jesus said, I've come to seek for something and then save it because it's lost. You never seek for something unless it holds value to you. If I lose a paper clip, I don't go look for it. But I have a wedding ring that I've, and I, I'm, I, I can't hold a detail with both hands. I lose everything. But in this June will be in 35 years, I've never lost this ring. And when I've had, when I have misplaced it, I searched until I found it because it holds value to me. And what Jesus is saying to that crowd who questioned why he was invading the lives of people that they despised, he said, because they hold value to me. They matter to me. And I'm not only do they matter to me, but I'm, I'm seeking for them. For years, I've, I've said, and I've heard others say, I, I found Jesus. The truth of it is, he wasn't lost. He found me. And there's a place of gratefulness that comes when you recognize that he found you. It's a place that you can never forget. And if you do, you turn into one of the Pharisees. What was it about the way Jesus treated people and the way he spoke to them that rescued their lives? He told this parable to answer the charge against him. Here was the charge. Why? If you are who you say you are, why are you spending time, not only time, but giving value and credence and worth to people that are so broken and sinful and then you have the gall to eat with, eat with it. Why would you do that? And Jesus answers that charge through a parable. A parable of a lost sheep, a lost coin, and two lost sons. Everybody say two. People usually refer to that parable as the, par par the parable of the prodigal son. There's two lost sons, not just one. I actually would rename it the parable of a loving father. But because we're so sin conscious, we can only see the brokenness in people and not the rescue. 
We even named religiously the parable the opposite of its purpose. Why? Because God's holy and I'm not. And it's natural to think of me and God in the same sentence and shrink back. So let's look at the lost sheep. Jesus is answering the charge. Listen now. Why do you care for people that are broken? Why do you care for people that are preeminently broken and trapped and committed to sin? I'm serious. If it were today, they'd have a podcast on it. This is the crowd that's got that lifestyle down. Luke 15, verse 3. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Everybody say, until he finds it. Until say it out loud with all the campus, campuses. Listen, at TCI, say it out loud where you hear it. Until he finds it. That's God speaking to you. Until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, goes home, then he calls his friends, neighbors together, rejoice with me. For I have found my lost sheep. I tell you in the same way, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need to repent. Why did he pick sheep? Because sheep get lost by their nature. It's the, the nature of sheep. That's why they get lost. Simply because it's the nature of, of, of a sheep, if you will, to get lost. I don't know if you've ever lost one of your children. It's a bad day when that happens. You, you just, the things that go through your mind when one of your little ones disappears in a public place, it's terrifying. My wife and I, with our kids, were in Las Vegas for a wedding. This was years ago. And our youngest was, I think, four and a half, five years old. Her name's Alexa. She's 25 now. And I'm an Italian father. And so just... She's still single. She's dating a wonderful kid. But I did tell him, I'm willing to go back to prison. It's okay. And uh, and we were staying at the MGM Grand, which is this amazing hotel in Las Vegas. Because if you go there in the middle of July, it's almost free. Because the devil doesn't want to go to Las Vegas in July. It's too, it's too hot for him. But we're staying, and they have this lazy river, and I mean, it's, it's like a river. It's, just inc it, it's crazy. And we're all going around this river, and you're in these, you know, you have little, you know, tubes or whatever. And we lose Alexa. She's gone. We can't find her. And number one, this river's moving, and you're thinking, did she drown? And then your mind begins, wait, I'm in Las Vegas. Did someone just take my daughter. Now, we took the first two minutes, three minutes running around, my wife and I trying to find our little, our little girl. The other two, we knew where they were, stay here, and we left them to go find her. We couldn't find her. I saw a security guy over by a door, and I went over to him as calmly as I could, and I said, my daughter's missing. Whatever protocol you do, please do it now. Here's what he did. Yeah, oh, yeah. Have you looked over here? I said, my daughter's missing. Whatever protocol you do, do it now. Well, have you considered, and now, I'm not going to do it as loudly as I did because it might break something. I looked at him and I said, my daughter's missing. Get that thing off your lap. Speak into it or I'm going to put you through that wall. And he started to do the protocol. Shut it down. How do I know that? Because we do stuff with kids. Someone's missing. We shut it down. Shut it down. I don't care what you think. Well, you're out of your mind. You better believe I'm out of my mind. Help me find my daughter. She's lost. And Jim Bob got on. They started changing. And they shut it down. The exits. Why? My daughter's lost. And I'm going to do anything to find her. And let me tell you, when I found her, she didn't even know she was lost because it's the nature of a child to get lost. She didn't even figure it out yet. She didn't do any rejoicing, but when we found her, we did. I said, did you go back and apologize to the, to the guy? Probably I should have, but no, I didn't because I thought, you're an idiot, and I need to beat you like a rented mule. 
because I'm a father. Wait, why that kind of passion? Because she's valuable to me. Jesus is going after lost people because they matter to him. I was willing to shake a security guard. He was willing to die on a cross. Do we value the people he died for as much as he does? And do we realize that all of us were those people? Secondly, there was a lost coin. A lost coin. In Luke 15, verse 8, he said, or suppose, remember, he's answering the charge, how do you care for women? Or how do you care, this is not a woman, but how do you care for people? How do you care, why do you care about lost people? He said, or suppose a woman that has 10 silver coins loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? Say again out loud, until she finds it. Until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, for I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Coins get lost because of circumstances. A coin doesn't have a will of its own, if you will. It's just, it happens. And and Jesus chose a sheep because it had value to a shepherd. He chose the coin because it had value to the woman. Coins get lost because of circumstances. People very often are broken and trapped in the stain of sin because of the circumstances of their life. I think of some of the things I've watched people go through as a pastor. And I hear of their childhoods. And I hear the details of it. And I I wonder how they, they survived to even stay alive let alone want to have a relationship with God because religion will have told them somehow God had a reason for all this misery instead of that there was an enemy trying to kill them. One in seven people, and I'm about to say something, if it triggers you, please hear this. There's there's another side to this. I didn't believe this statistic when I heard it many years ago, but it, it it, 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 it might be actually not going far enough. One in seven people that are adults today have experienced some form of sexual abuse, some form of it. One in seven. That means many people listening to you right now, I just brought up something that you've either, God's helped you to deal with or you've buried. One in seven. Here's what I know about people that have been abused, whether it be any type of abuse, but specifically anything regarding sexuality, anything, is it does something to them and it breaks something inside of them and it impacts their sexuality. Whether that be homosexuality, heterosexually, either being afraid to ever be in a relationship, to be married, or just being with anybody and everybody. Gender. Every person is attached to these issues. Jesus saw the person. Christians have a tendency to see the issue. Jesus didn't die for issues. He died for people. I want to help you to see that you are the only hope of the world if you know Christ. And if you don't, maybe you don't know him because you have never seen him as he is. And he he died to rescue people. There's a precious young lady in our church, been there for years. And I know her story. She was molested probably more times than she can remember. Since she's, I think, about seven or eight years old. Up to about 15. Very, very wonderful person. Broken, as you you can imagine. And, and, And her way of dealing with that kind of brokenness, she, and through the years, it really trying to encourage her to get help. So painful, she just never took the steps. Terribly depressed. I mean, terribly depressed for good. I mean, you can understand it, right? So she deals with this sexual trauma by, the, by, by obesity. That's one way that no man will ever hurt me again. Very, very bright, bright woman uh, in the medical profession. She knows what she's doing to her body. <clears throat> she's also a diabetic. So she knows she's shortening her life. But none of that matters. 
She's so depressed that where she worked, she had very good health care. They let her, they, they paid for her to go into a treatment center in Arizona for six weeks. She comes back to see go to our church after six weeks and, and, and lets me know personally, Pastor John, I don't think I can come to victory anymore because I, I, I believe I'm a man. I said, well, I called her by name. I said, I'd like to meet with you and talk to you. And so the first thing we did when we sat down, I said, I have no desire to change how you feel. And by the way, neither does God. He wants to help you, not do something to change you so he can stomach you. I said, I want you to keep coming. I don't care what you think. You see, Jesus knew this, that if he couldn't find you and bring you to his presence, he couldn't help you. Her first response was, I have to leave. And she gave me a new name to call her. And I've known her for years, and I know her story. I said, well, tell me what happened. Well, they told me that it's because, that I really think I'm a man is why I'm this way. Now, their gender dysphoria is real. I'm not minimizing that, okay? But you don't diagnose somebody in two weeks, even clinically, and put, put this woman on testosterone. For three weeks, she's been on testosterone. I said, did you tell them about the abuse? Yes. Did you talk, because we've had this conversation, about the fact that you're trying to kill yourself with obesity and it's a shield for men? Yes. But they said, this is the reason. They did. I said, listen, I love you and I'm not going to lie to you, but whoever did that to you abused you further. Not that she may not, I said, you, I don't know if you have that issue, but neither do they, not in two weeks. She said, so what should I do? I can't come here because, because she, she, look, she dressed like a guy. I said, you can come. She goes, yeah, but what do people think? I said, you sit in the front row beside Michelle and I. She goes, but what will people think? I said, I, I don't care what they think. I'm not injured. What, what will, they, will they think you just affirmed this? I said, I don't care what they think. I care about you, and I know God can't help you if you're not around people that will love you. I said, just come. She said, but I'm, I'm going to dress like a guy. I said, you can wear a polka dotted hat. I don't care. So what if somebody would have come to you and was offended? I would have said, I love you. Are you a Christian? Yes. I said, then find another church that, that doesn't care about broken people. Because I don't give a flip what you think until you care about that girl. Now, why would you say that? Well, number one, I've been pastoring for 30 years, and you could say stuff like that. If you're younger, you don't, you don't say that. But why, why would I be so bold? Because she matters to God. Now, I met with her, and I don't do a lot of counseling, and that, I don't even call it that, but about six times. And by the end of it, she came to me, and she said, no, I've stopped taking this testosterone, not because of any reason other than it was messing her up. I won't use the word she used, but she said, I don't know how you men deal with this. It's turned me into a, um, she used a word that would allude to having sex all the time. I'll just leave it at that. I said, um, listen, I don't want you to try to change how you feel. I want you to get help. And if you have to deal with this issue, God can help you through that issue. You don't, that's, but we both know that's not the real issue of your life. So why don't you, and, and try to encourage, and she still hasn't fully gotten help. She's not transitioning, not because she's better, because it just wasn't the right option to make the pain go away. So, so what do you do with her? What would Jesus have done with her? The same thing he did to them. He found them and said, stay beside me. Because he will make people whole of whatever brokenness they have, sexual and otherwise not to change them so he could stomach them, but to make them whole because he loves them. That day when I was with Bill Anzavino at a picnic that I didn't want to be at, I'm so glad that I met a man that cared about me and not the horrors I just told him. The third one was this, the lost sons, plural. <clears throat> the lost sons, and that's plural. 
The first, you see, the coin, of course, you're, you're lost by nature. The, no, I'm sorry, the sheep by nature, the coin by circumstance. But the lost sons, they did it by choice. What I'm trying, Jesus is saying to these religious self-righteous people is that they're this way by their nature. They're this way because of their circumstances. And some of them have even chosen it. But I want you to see my view of how I think of them, no matter how they got here. A very familiar passage of scripture. I'll just read it to you. Because some may know it, some may not. In Luke 11, Luke 15, verse 11, this is the third thing that Jesus was answering the charge of why do you care for people that are so broken and so sinful and committed to their sin. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. Say it out loud, two sons. Two sons. Notice it's focused on two boys. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he, defi he divided his property between them. Say it out loud, them. So they both got their, 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 their inheritance, correct? Yep. Two people have been given a full inheritance. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, and he set off for a distant country to get away from God. The father represents God. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. When Jesus mentions his behavior, he's very vague. But when you meet his self-righteous older brother, he's very specific. Verse 14, after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. Not a good job for a Jewish boy. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that he, the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare. And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me, say that out loud, make me. Make me, make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. He did not go back because he had turned from his sin. He went back because his sin had destroyed him. And he didn't go back to have a relationship with his father. He went back so that he could be a servant to his father. And he asked his father to make his son a servant and stop calling him his son. That's what sin does to people. And any parent who isn't abusive knows that's not even possible. You can't make your child a servant, no matter what they've done. Even if you somehow wished you could to stop the pain of what a child may be doing to you. In verse 20, he got up and he went to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with compassion Compassion for him, he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. I want you to get the picture. God lets you do what you choose to do. And in this case, he let the boy choose, and he didn't go after him. But every day he was watching. How do I know? Because when he was a long way off, his father saw him. And the moment his father saw him, he reacted. Remember, Jesus is answering the charge. What do you do with sinful people? Why are you with them? Why do you care? And he ran to him. It's the only place in the Bible I see God running. I see his eyes running all over the earth, but God ran. And look, he didn't run toward the, the, the perfectly righteous person. There were none. <clears throat> but he ran to someone who had broken his heart. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And he never got finished with his speech. But the father said to his servants, quick. Everybody say quick. quick. Say it again, quick. quick. Do you understand? One step back toward God. One step is all it takes. It may feel like a thousand miles. It's one step. Quick, bring the best rope and put it. Put it on him. 
put, place a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet. Bring, take, bring here the fatted calf, kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost. He was lost. He was lost. And now he's found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. Everybody say in the field. He's working in the field like a servant, even though he has a full inheritance. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants, asked, what's going on? He said, your brother has come. Your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you. He's talking to the Pharisees who think they've earned the favor of God. All of these years I've been slaving for you and I have never disobeyed your orders. That's how the Pharisees acted yet you never gave me, yet you never, I thought he just was given a full inheritance. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, Jesus defined it as wild living, the brother knew the sins. Careful of the sins you mark in others. Self-righteousness is deadly. You cannot rescue people from a position of self-righteousness because if you do, you have to be the savior because you're the righteous one. All of us are lost. All of us, all of us are lost, including this older brother who was deceived. And listen to what the father said in verse 31. He said, my son, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and be glad because, listen, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. He started by saying, this son of mine. The brother said, this son of, the father said, this son of mine. The brother said, this son of yours. And he said, the father said, no, this brother of yours. What I'm hoping to help you see is how God rescues human beings from the depths of the brokenness of sin. Whether it's by your nature, whether it's like the sheep, circumstances of life may have brought you where you are. You're sitting at TCI today, and, and I guarantee you it's a little of both of those. Maybe it's a lot of the third for all of us. We just made some really bad choices. I was the one that chose to go. I went to someone who represented God, at least in my mind, and I buried that man. And all he could do was, was reach out and tell me who God was, not who I, I knew I was messed up. You know, I don't need a Christian to tell me I'm messed up. I knew that all on my own. And you had two messed up boys who both thought they could earn their father's love and favor and they were trying to earn something that they could never earn. It was already theirs. Nothing, nothing that I said to you today is about God winking at wrongdoing and saying it's no big deal. Just the opposite. It's God loving me enough to rescue me in the middle of it so he can set me free from it. Not so that I can please him by not offending him, but I can be rescued and made whole because he loves me just like any decent parent would do. And I want to pray for you today right where you're at. Whether if you're, if, if you're at the Boardman location or at TCI or online or here in this campus, I want to pray for you. I want to give you the opportunity to come to the one who gave his life for you. Maybe you, you, you think, well, you know, I, I, get, I, I, I think I'm a Christian. I go to church. I, I was, I was baptized as a baby. I've been confirmed. I've had sacraments of my church. That's wonderful. That's, that's sacred. It could be a blessing to you, but it won't make you a Christian. No church, no sacrament of any church can make you right with God, including this one, including the one I pastor. But if you died today and stood before a holy God, 
what gives you the confidence that you would go into heaven. If that answer starts with, I did this, you'll be found wanting. There are only two ways to die in life. In your sin, where you pay for it yourself eternally, or redeemed from your sin, having received the one who paid the debt for you. Jesus came from heaven to earth to seek for you, to receive you into his life, to rescue you from a stain of sin that you could never clear yourself. A holy and a righteous God judged me guilty because he's righteous. And that judgment separated me forever because of my sin. But God so loved me that he came and took a human body, born of a virgin, and he hung on a cross for one purpose, so that the wrath of God and the penalty of sin do me to fall to himself. God judged me guilty and then he came and poured the wrath and punishment do me on himself. And then Jesus died in our place. <clears throat> he was buried in my place. Then he rose from the dead and he offers you eternal life. So my question for you today, what will you do with Jesus? Whether you've never given your life to Jesus or you're far from God, I want to give you the opportunity to pray with me today because he wants you close to him. You can't get any further than you are in his absence and he wants you literally a part of who he is. He loves you so desperately. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you've, if you've never invited Christ into your life or you're not sure, you say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. At our campuses, your heads are bowed, eyes closed. If you're online, you could put this down into the chat. If you've never invited Christ into your life, or you're not sure, and you say, please include me in a prayer to invite Jesus in my life, I will do that and pray for you right where you're seated. We'll pray it out loud and together with you. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, would you just simply raise your hand right now and I'll pray for you right where you're seated. Do it right now and I'll pray for you. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands back down. If you raised your hand or you should have, please pray this out loud together with all of us. Jesus will come into your heart. He will never leave you and never forsake you. Pray it out loud where you hear it. We're all going to pray it together with you at all of our campuses, at all of our locations. Pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I pray it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. And I believe with all my heart that Jesus is the Son of God. He died on a cross to bear my sin. I open the door of my heart, the door of my life. And Jesus, I invite you in. I receive you now to be my Savior and Lord. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin debt is canceled. When I die, I'm heaven bound because Jesus is the Lord of my life. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to ask you just quickly, right where you're seated, if you'll simply raise your hand. Our host team is going to give you a free Bible right now. We just want to help you take your next steps. So just raise, just raise your hand. They'll track you down. If you're, on, if you're online, or you could text the word believe to the number there and we'll get back to you as well. We want to help you take your next steps.